is an environmental monitoring system. The Intella Air is a this commercial brand name for it. There are others on the market, but uh, it's monitoring temperature and humidity of the air. There's a weather station you see around the uh, the bin here. Much like what we have at the station, it's just monitoring temperature and humidity, and it's operating fans based on pre-programmed conditions that would set the equilibrium moisture content so it doesn't overdry, and it and it actually can re-wet some wet beans, for example. And there's a lot of money to be made if you if you can control the moisture, especially with soybeans. If you're losing a half, if you overdry corn or, or wheat, a point, which you may want to do that for storage, we'll talk about that. Uh, it gives you a little bit more storability if it's a little drier going into the summer months especially, but that can cost you a nickel, a bushel in weight. So you got to look at that opportunity, okay, I want to store it, Am I willing to dry it down a little lower to hold it a little longer, better quality? But then I got to get a better, got to return, get a return on that at the market. Uh, but it sometimes, as as Todd's figures showed, that market will uh, take a turn on you, right? But at the same time, I think uh, from what they were telling me about the Intel Air system and its uh, managing capacity, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of out of their part on managing and running the fans. So it's made your job a lot easier. But uh, I think they've done a great job here with that and there's just testimony to it right there. But again, they have some of the tools. Not all farmers have that. And they have to rely on some manual tools to uh, check quality, uh, check the temperature in the bin, um, check for insect activity, those kinds of things. And we brought some tools along to share and we'll show what, uh, what's state of the art, I guess you might say, uh, back to the manual operation. But I asked uh, Ben to come over uh, to model, <coughs> if you would, a climbing well, harness. I got voluntold, I see. Voluntold. You, that's happened to you before. Yeah. You've been in 4-H, you know how, old, how this works. Can you figure that out, how that works? We got, I got the hard part done there for you. If you work at a commercial elevator, you have to wear this apparatus. Farmers is optional, all right? But uh, university, it's not. <laughs> so. That's why we have one. We were actually doing a, a grain storage study where we were climbing all over bins like this and measuring, carefully measuring the surface profile and surface shape and then the geometry of the bin and we were uh, using our measurements to estimate the volume and then from that the packing. And uh, we were using the weight tickets to reconcile our, our numbers. But we, we, as it turned out, bottom line of that study was we had over 300 bins in our data set and they were from all over Kentucky, um, Michigan, Kansas. You got it? Yeah. Well, no, not this side. You don't have that side? But we were a little better than the FSA or the RMA's procedure, which they were just using charts. They still use it the old, um, the old fashioned way. <laughs> How you feeling? Yeah, there again. <laughs> Can you sing soprano for us? I will if you lift it. <laughs> We're not going to test it. But I just want to show folks. Yeah. You're pretty secure with this yeah. because it has a, it has him. If he falls, it's got him. <laughs> so if you're, <laughs> that's, all we, that's all we're going to do. But when you get on top of the bin, of course, you want to release your hook and tie off to something secure and then you're good to go and you can measure, make your measurements and not have to worry about falling, okay? So why would you want to, why would you want to need, why do you think you may want to get inside a bin? Or would you, <laughs> ever? <laughs> the, most people, of course, you wouldn't ever want to uh, voluntarily, except that you may want to need, to, if you don't have temperature cables or a way to re remotely check conditions inside the bin. Um, and I've been inside bins myself before we even thought about using climbing harnesses some years ago, but uh, wouldn't do that now, but uh, you live and learn. But you need to check the condition because that's value. And if you start having insect activity or mold growth, you're gonna start losing weight, and that costs you money. So you wanna guard against those kind of activities. And what I've got on the handout is to talk about some of the conditions that insects like for thriving in stored grain. They, like, they, they prefer high temperatures. Uh, moles actually prefer high humidity, high moisture conditions, and uh, if you have biological activity, if insects start 
insect populations start increasing or mold activity starts thriving, uh, that'll create heat. And that's why it's a good idea to have temperature cables in the bins because they'll detect that heat and give you a signal. You can monitor that with your phone. That's the way Brian does it. Uh, it's very easy to access. You don't have to climb on top of the bin. Okay? Uh, good exercise, you know, getting up there, but it's a lot easier and you have a lot more assurance and you can check a lot more spots with those temperature cables in the bin than you can manually. Because with manually, the best you can do is, is around the surface um, where you might have some condensation or some leaks or something. And on that note, uh, you know, when you put grain in the bin, you cool it down in the fall, things are pretty stable generally. But if you have a leak, that can develop into a hot spot, right? So again, getting back to the, to the idea and the value of having temperature cables to guard against um, any quality problems that might arise in the bin, especially if you're going to hold it for a long time. Uh, you mentioned the moisture of the wheat that was coming out was uh, on, was it 12 and a half, 13? What was the, what was it? 13.5. 13.5, which is right at the uh, threshold for wheat. Corn market generally 15 around here, some places at 15 and a half, some of the feed mills like 15 and a half, some of the food grade buyers like 14% corn. But uh, for, for the most part it's 15 uh, for the white corn market that you have here, I assume, uh, where it's loaded out on a barge. So. so how do you locate the temperature cables inside a large bin? You want to kind of space them to where you get equal volumes of grain monitored. And the installers will uh, they'll have a map based on the size of the bin and then based on the, on the pocketbook of the customer. Because you, really, uh, you really can't have too many temperature cables in there. Grain is a really good insulator. And you can have a hot spot away from a cable and it can go weeks without, before that grows to a point where it gets to a sensor, then you've got a you can have a large problem. Uh, for that reason, I think there's some other tools that are coming on the market now with it's sensing CO2 for example, that will detect uh, an off gas, which is a byproduct of grain respiration, insect activity, and mold activity. They consume oxygen and they give off CO2. So when CO2 levels start coming up, um, you, you, have a, you have a problem somewhere in the bin. Now finding it is, not, is, is maybe another matter, but for the most part, if you have a problem, generally you would run the fan to moderate the temperatures. Okay, even before they may, might be detected under temperature cable. But back to your question, uh, you would want to have as many temperature cables as you could afford, I think, in a bin and space those. You definitely want to have one or two located near the center because generally that's, these hang, these hang vertically. They hang vertically from the roof. And the roof has to be reinforced. You can't just, you, just a point load on the roof rib is not, is inadequate. You gotta have, you gotta distribute that load because when you offload grain, the pull down forces on those cables is tremendous. And so you have to have them really well anchored inside the bin. You, and in a retro bin, you want to be sure to go back to the manufacturer and let them work with you about how those supports need to be, where they need to be placed for the temperature cable so that they'll be supported correctly. Otherwise, you, and there's been cases where the cables have actually weren't installed properly and they pull the roof down when they offloaded grain. You have a sensor about every three feet. All the way up to the top, yep. So, it, like I say, it can measure temperature and check temperature in places where you can't run a probe for sure. No, especially, in especially in a big bin like that, you're not going to get a probe down very far down in that bin. No. <laughs> Even with a vac, I know some guys that use that. It's allowable storage time for, this is for hard red spring wheat. We don't have data for soft red winter wheat. But this is better than corn, <laughs> okay? Uh, but this is a table that the um, University of Illinois put out last summer at our national meeting, and they predicated it off of some work that was done in Canada. So it's the best we have for, <clears throat> for a wheat crop. But the, what's interesting is you can see how quickly you need to get hold of the moisture. Now this is predicated on a pretty conservative um, threshold of a 0.04 percent of dry matter loss which impacts seed viability and that's why they set that level okay so it's pretty conservative but if you're a seed producer this would probably be what you want would want to go by and you can see how important it is to get the crop dried down 
Uh, if you're harvesting in the low 20s even, get it down below 18, for example, to have any kind of storage life at all and preserve the, the seed quality at 80 degrees. And this is typically where we are when we're harvesting wheat in Kentucky. Now you get it on down to 16% moisture, then you've got a lot of storage life in that crop. And then when you start to cool it in the fall, you can almost double the storage time by cooling at 10 degrees okay, as you move up those rows in that table. Not so much true on the, uh, at, on the drier wheat, but you do have a lot of storability at that moisture level. Thresholds for temperature, how they, they like warm temperatures. When we start to cool grain down, they become less active, certainly. Even at 60 degrees, they're not going to be um, making more insects. Okay. So you, want to, you can get down to 60 degrees a lot of times in September in Kentucky. And one device we've used in, um, in our training in, in developing countries is a small, inexpensive uh, hygrometer, measures temperature and, and uh, humidity. This could be used inside, a, you could take a grain sample, put it inside a sealed sack or bag, Ziploc bag, and after 20 minutes it'll stabilize, and you can read from those numbers in equilibrium chart this on the next page, page four, for wheat, called the equilibrium uh, moisture content for, this is for soft red winter wheat. And there's a column that's highlighted there, 65% humidity, okay? And the reason that, that we're focusing on that column is because anything to the right of that is gonna favor a little bit, it's gonna be humid enough inside the, the grain environment that'll favor mold activity, mold growth. And if you get to the extreme of that, it's where you have to worry about it having a problem with Don or vomitoxin or any, uh, the fusarium mold that produces uh, uh, vomitoxin really likes moderate temperatures, even to 60 degrees, but it likes a lot of humid, humidity, so even at 90 plus percent humidity. But so you want to, that's the other reason to keep it dry is to control mold activity, right? So from that chart then, if you go to the right of that, we're, we're looking at the same information that's on the chart, but then it's just isolating three humidity levels, 70, 65, and 60% humidity, okay, on that graph that you see there. And so the 65% humidity is dry enough to consider safer storage. So below that line, we're good. Above that line, we might be at risk for some mold activity in the bin, okay? And different crops have different shaped curves for this. But that's why I wanted to focus on uh, wheat for our topic today, of course, and then to show that if you're holding, actually holding wheat at 12.5% in the summer, you have a little better storage life. It'll store a little bit better. You, and I think Brian would agree with that. But the other part of that is you keep it cold then, then you've got uh, kind of a good balance point, I think, on that. But you could use something like the hygrometer, uh, take samples out of the bin, and if you don't have a moisture meter, you know, that's one way to, it's a, it's a low cost way to, to get at the, at the moisture level inside the bin. Um, I think most folks do have portable moisture meters, but uh, two or three hundred dollars at a whack on those versus something inexpensive like that would be a, uh, something you can carry in your pocket for um, remote use if you needed that. This is a, a dial thermometer, okay? You can easily insert it inside the surface and see if you have any hot spots. That's one tool you could use there. If I could get Edwin to help pass that around or let folks look at that. And then if you feel, if you ate your Cheerios this morning. Uh, so this is a compartmentalized. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now this is the open-throated. So this is obviously a one tool you can use for collecting samples in uh, stored grain inside the bin or if you have uh, inside a truck. This happens to be an open-throated probe, okay? So all the samples that you pull out of the out of the truck or the bin are mixed when you dump it out. You can get a compartmentalized probe that would have each compartment. So if you're looking at temperature, for example, uh, insect activity down past the profile or the surface, you can see if there's a higher concentration at the top, which is most likely versus below the surface. And then you would have to empty that out into a tarp or a sheet and set, keep that separate as you analyze those samples. Another device for, of course, for sampling grain 
is a deep cup probe and obviously it's got uh, extensions for this shaft and you can get it down as far as you could push it but uh, when you're pushing it down into the into the grain it's tight and then as you release it pull it up give it a little shake it'll fill the cup and you can extract your sample in, in that method so this is not a this is not a probe for sampling but it's a probe for measuring and monitoring insect activity okay very inexpensive plastic tube a cup at the base we've used this in some wheat monitoring insect studies we've done here the tube itself just has um, holes drilled around the, the perimeter of it. You want to stick that just where the grain surface is there, okay? So as you can start, because a lot of times the insect activity, and Raul will talk more about this, but it's near the surface. That's where they're most active. That's where it's warmest in the summer, of course. And so that's where they'll be active. It would drop down in. Once a week, you can go ahead and pull these probes out. You always want to be sure you got them tied off, right? Yeah, you don't want them to end up in the auger. But you can collect your sample, run that to the lab, and uh, count your insects and know what kind of insects you have in, in the grain. I'm not going to talk about the full line of uh, personal protection equipment, but I'm a big fan of dust masks. Because uh, over, over the years, it seems like I've grown sensitive, a lot more sensitive to dust than I ever was. So maybe, maybe it had something to do with that rock quarry I worked at when I was in college. Yeah, I don't know. It does have a tendency to, to accumulate, I think, on you. But uh, the one I like is one shown here. It's got a nice foam um, layer on the outside so you get a nice fit. And then it has an exhaust port so that you don't trap moisture as you exhale. So there's all kinds of masks. Uh, I, like, I like two straps. This one has a, a metal nose bridge. Those kinds of, there's all, again, all kinds of straps you can use. Uh, but what I would guard against is a single strap mask because it's not going to give you a good fit. Okay? This is kind of a minimal control. Uh, we have others with uh, full face, half face respirators uh, give you more dust protection, of course, because you have more filter area. For the most part, the handout guides you through the, the uh, steps we'd, we'd like to describe and summarize as SLAM for monitoring and um, holding grain in good condition during storage, but SLAM stands for sanitation uh, of the facility, the equipment, loading of the bin, and then drawing it down. So coring the bin after it's loaded, that's very important. And then if you look at the first page, there's a picture here of actually uh, taken from the uh, bin in the county, where uh, the fellow went inside the bin to, uh, the bin was full, he saw a small piece of uh, small grain in the center, near the center of the bin, he thought he could jog that loose and, and force it through the sump, but it turned out the, sump, the, the spoiled grain was bigger than he realized. It blocked the sump. Long story short, he got trapped in the bin up to his chest. His family called 911. When that happens, you get all manner of vehicles around the farm, right? I mean, I went out, I slipped out and got some pictures, and that's when I took this after they extracted him out on the backboard. Took him to the hospital. He was back home having dinner with his family that evening. That's why it's easy to tell the story because not everyone that goes into a bin comes out alive. But this man did. And uh, the problem was that he had a chunk of grain in there. He didn't core it properly. He didn't have temperature cables in there. Okay? This is a 12-year-old picture, but you know, we, we know better ways to manage grain now. It wasn't this farm, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't the county, but not on this farm. But it goes to the point of the importance of coring. Okay? And also to the point of if you keep grain in good condition, uh, a lot of times it'll eliminate the need to go in and do some emergency extraction of the grain to break loose a crust that is unstable. You could have a, a horizontal bridge that can break and fall through, then workers can fall down below a cavity if it's below that bridge, which is, has happened before. Uh, if you have crusted grain along the wall of the bin and you go to break that loose, there have been cases where it has avalanched and smothered people, the workers in the bin. Store grain can be fatal. If, you're not, if you don't know what you're doing and if it's not managed well, you can stay away from, from uh, quality problems. I think you stay away from safety problems to the, for the most part. Some of the other information I have in here also speaks to the other points on SLAM. We've also we've talked about loading. 
Uh, the other two points are aeration. Uh, aeration is important to keep, um, keep the grain as cool as possible, as long as possible. Uh, generally, fortunately in Kentucky, we have wintertime temperatures that, uh, uh, that discourage mold and, act, and insect activity. So if we cool grain to about 35 degrees in the wintertime, December usually is the best opportunity we have to do that, the earliest opportunity. And then seal the fans so we don't get air currents moving through the grain and warming it back up. So we, grain is a good insulator, as we talked about, so it should stay cold and you can hold it into the summer months. The last piece of SLAM is monitoring, and, and as we talked about, you can do it manually with some of the tools we showed here, or you can do it with some, some automatic uh, controllers, and I have those listed in the handout as well. Um, last thing I'll mention here, uh, the website, we have um, publications on wheat drying, handling, and storage. Uh, we just published a I work with some other ag engineers across the country to publish the, and upgrade the Midwest Plan Service Handbook on grain drying, handling, and storage, and that's available for uh, it's it's a it's a greatly expanded version of the previous edition, which was uh, 30 years old, <laughs> but um, it's, it, it includes now a safety an entire safety chapter and one on automation. Okay, so it's um, greatly improved from what we had to work with before.